Welcome to Omundo de Pilar Aymara, Rosalia TV. Today with a very special guest, because as you know, there is going to be elections to the Scottish Parliament on the 6th of May. So, and the appearance of the Alba party has uh, caused a lot of excitement and changed the whole scene. So let's talk to Mr. Alex Salmon. Mr. Alex Salmon, hello. Hello, Pilar. <laughs> How are you? Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Salmon. Uh, today is the anniversary of the Declaration of Abroad, 1320, and you and the Alba Party have made your own declaration. So tell us more about that and, the, and about the Alba Party, of course. Well, the Declaration of Abroad, as, as you well know, Pila, was one of the uh, astonishing uh, uh, documents in medieval history which some people argue, I would argue, was the first expression of popular sovereignty uh, in Europe, uh, which uh, introduced the concept of elective kingship. In other words, uh, Robert the Bruce, the hero king of Scotland, who established and fought for Scottish independence at the Battle of Bannockburn, but in 1320, in a letter supporting Bruce to the Avignon Papacy, to Pope John XXII, the barons, the nobles, the freeholders, the prelates, the king's court himself, but crucially, something called the community of the realm of Scotland, introduced the concept that if good King Robert, as they called him, didn't defend their rights as an independent country, they would get rid of him and get somebody else. Now that was a revolutionary <coughs> idea for, for medieval Europe, uh, as indeed were some of the other constitutional innovations that were introduced in Scotland at that time, uh, and therefore, it's a, a ringing, wonderful document uh, that uh, rings through history, uh, especially the phrase, uh, for in truth, for it's not glory or riches or honours for which we are fighting, but for liberty, uh, for that alone, which no honest person gives up, but with life itself. Uh, so these are the ringing phrases from the Arbroath Declaration, uh, which was sealed uh, in Arbroath, uh, 721 years ago, on this day. So we have today launched a, a new Scottish declaration, a declaration for Scotland, uh, enunciated in Ellen Aberdeenshire on the 6th of April 2021 and broadcast on the World Wide Web, which again reinforces Scotland's right of self-determination, says that Alapa MSPs and I hope other MSPs elected in the independence platform will do everything possible to further Scottish interests in the independence cause and will make sure by taking domestic and international action that Scotland's wishes for independence will be respected. Uh, so it's a good day, an auspicious day, a great day uh, to launch the, the new Scottish declaration and the Alapa party who are making ground, as you're well aware, having been launched for 10 days we're now registering in the opinion polls and have every expectation that we shall gain seats to length and bread for Scotland and inject some serious independence campaigning into the next Scottish Parliament. <coughs> what are the main objectives of the Alba Party, Mr. Salmon, uh, going into this election? Are you in competition with the SNP or are you a rival for the Unionist parties? Well, uh, we've got three aims. One is to secure a supermajority for independence in the Scottish Parliament. Two is to uh, uh, put forward a, an economic recovery plan from the COVID pandemic, a serious recovery plan, much more profound than was seen from Westminster or indeed from Scotland as yet. Uh, and thirdly, to reframe the independence platform, to take account of the modern age. We've been not just through a pandemic, but uh, Scotland is now out of the European Union. And what pertained in 2014 no longer pertains in 2021. Uh, we believe that the Alapa party is not in competition with the SNP because the SNP fight the constituency seats. The Alapa fights only in the regional list. I'm standing here in the northeast of Scotland, one of eight regions of Scotland. In the last election, there were 137,000 SNP votes in the regional list. That element of the ballot elected a zero, big round zero MSPs, because the SNP had won so many constituencies. 
Now, Alapa, if half of that number transfers to Alapa, uh, and of course we pick up a few more, but if half of that number transfers, then we will elect four Alapa MSPs on the regional list in the northeast of Scotland, and the same pattern will be repeated the length and breadth for the country. So the upside for independence is that we could get up to 90, perhaps even more, independent supporting MSPs in a parliament 129. The opinion poll at the weekend, which caused so much excitement, suggested there'd be 79, including six Alapa MPs elected from a party which has been formed for, in that poll for less than a week. Mm -hmm. So therefore, this is the opportunity. There's a huge upside to voting Alapa on the regional list. We're not in competition with the SNP. Indeed, I freely said I'll be voting SNP at constituency level and I'll be voting for Alapa for Scotland on the regional list. And if you are elected and if you hold the Indy majority balance, how are you going to use that leverage to push the SNP to make a move on independence? And my second question here is, will you vote for Nicola Sturgeon as a first minister? Well, the, the answer to the second question is yes, obviously we'll vote for the, the, the leading candidate and the independence supporting candidate to be first minister. We're not intending to go into government because, they, well, A, it's not necessary, and B, the Alapa, I think, has ideas to put forward. We're not mm -hmm. intent on seeking government positions. Rather, we've got ideas on independence and on other matters to offer to a parliament, and we want to see the parliament take the initiative on in independence. We think in the first week, that is the second week in May, there should be a motion passed in the Scottish Parliament requiring the Scottish Government to begin independence negotiations with Westminster. And we think we've got a whole battery of ideas behind that to make sure that Westminster obeys the wishes of the Scottish people. But however that's done, there is a fundamentally more likelihood of that happening if we can recast this debate not as Tory party against SNP, Prime Minister in London against First Minister in Scotland, but rather put it as it should be seen of an English Tory Prime Minister refusing to accept the will of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish people, the whole community of the realm of Scotland. And if we cast the independence debate in that fashion, then Scotland will win it. If we allow it to be party against party, SNP against Tories, Prime Minister against First Minister, then we'll lose it. Mm -hmm. So it's important that the independence debate is cast by a supermajority in the Scottish Parliament or representing the Scottish people. Mr. Salmon, the <laughs> Alba party is like a revelation, it's a, a revolution, I say. Uh, it took the Greens about 20 years to reach 6% of vote, of the vote. And according to the, to the last poll, uh, it has taken the Alba party less than 20, year, 20 days to get there. Do you think the Yes movement has been waiting for a credible pro the alternative to vote for uh, on the list? I think there is a, an army waiting to be led. It's been waiting for some considerable time. Uh, I think the best comparison is the party which we have definitely overtaken already after 10 days of existence. We've overtaken the Liberal Democrats. We've overtaken them in terms of membership. Our membership is much greater than theirs now. We've overtaken them in terms of poll ratings. We've overtaken them in terms of the expected MSPs that we shall return on the poll that you mentioned. Uh, so in every respect, the Alapa party in less than a week when that poll was taken, have overtaken the Liberal Democrats, a, a political party which has been in existence in one disguise or another for 150 years, which is not bad going. Uh, but we have now the Green Party in our sights and the Conservative Party in our sights to overtake them in terms of membership and I hope in, in support. And that's what we'll be trying to do uh, as the campaign uh, continues. So we're, we're doing not bad. And if I was to uh, compare the Alapa Party to anything, I would say the Alapa Party resembles the Yes movement in Scotland in the high summer of 2014. It has the same positivity, it's the same rainbow aspects to it. It has the, uh, the same uh, joy in advocating uh, in strong and uh, resonant form uh, the case for independence for our country. So I think we are the embodiment and political form of the Yes movement reborn into a political party seven years later.
Let's change the subject a wee bit. Uh, when you were first minister, you brought into in the offensive behavior at football art after a lot of media pressure. It wasn't, it maybe wasn't very popular with football fans, but it was immensely popular with the public. Uh, however, it was voted down by the unionists with the help of the Greens. I am curious what your opinion is of the new gender recognition act and hate crime legislation that has caused so much controversy, particularly for many women. Well, I mean, Alipa agreed a women in inequalities paper on Saturday. Our first policy conference will be enunciating that on Friday, this coming Friday. It's a policy now which is part of the the firmament of Fallopa party policies, and we have our women's conference this coming Saturday. I mean, among the uh, 18 women standing for the Alipa party out of 32 candidates are some of the strongest feminist voices in Scotland. That is no accident. There is a huge concern about the the protection of, uh, of hard-won uh, safe places in terms of sex-based rights for women. That will be enunciated in our policy. Uh, in terms of the the act, there is a a difference in my view between a highly specific specified act in terms of the offensive behaviour, looking particularly at what was happening then and still is unfortunately in terms of uh, of offences around football matches and sectarianism in particular, religious divisions in society, than a, a more widespread hate crime bill, which has very loose definitions in some cases. There were amendments to it, of course, which uh, modified some of these, but there is concern, and there's certainly concern when people are not satisfied that the Crown Office in Scotland has a track record that would give people confidence, because you have to have great confidence in your prosecution authorities if you have that sort of legislation that they won't overinterpret or misinterpret what was the intention of Parliament. So I think there are question marks about hate crime, even though there were some concessions in the passage of the bill, and there's great concern about the gender recognition proposals, even though they've been postponed, obviously, to, uh, to another time. But it's going to be a, a significant debate in this uh, election, I can promise you that the Alapa Party's contribution to that debate will be entirely positive, entirely constructive, and will be be free of any of the of the aggressive language which has been so much part of that debate. Unfortunately, and one of my dear friends in life, of course, Joanna Cherry, MP, has been on the receiving end of a huge amount of abuse. Uh, somebody who has stood up for women's rights and for feminism for thirty years and more is entitled to a proper hearing without being abused through the uh, through the social media and the internet. And it does the people concerned no good at all that they've uh, done that. Of course, uh, I can't talk about the charges that have been uh, laid off late, but also the people who've refused to defend uh, Joanna have not uh, merged of any credit either. So I would defend Joanna Cherry's right to express her views. Uh, and I respect her totally for her consistent advocacy without prejudice to anyone of, of women's rights over that period of time. Mr. Samuel, let's go to let's go back for a moment for to 2014 because I love historical memory. At the International Press Conference, the ones where you were famously misreported by Nick Robinson. I asked you a question about fisheries and access to Scottish waters for Galician fishing boats. At that time, independence was the, was the monster of the Loch Ness, and apparently Scotland wouldn't be part of the EU. And here we are now, post-Brexit, with the fishing communities in chaos, and you are up in the northeast of Scotland. So what is the feeling amongst the fishing sector now? Well, I, I can tell you that exactly. I think on Thursday we're going to be releasing a, a video from John Buchan, uh, one of the most, well, probably actually the most experienced fisherman in Scotland. Uh, his boat, the Fairline, is currently patrolling uh, a offshore wind uh, uh, established turbines in the, in the Irish Sea, because partly because of lack of fishing opportunity. Uh, 
But John has given a, a statement in support of the Alapa Party and independence for Scotland. Uh, and he made in that statement, I thought, was a very ringing uh, <laughs> expression of what would happen to the great Brexiteers, uh, Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, or Nigel Farage, if they ever again came to Peterhead Harbour looking for votes. What John said in that video is they better learn to swim because they'd end up in the harbour, not in the, uh, in the fish market, canvassing under false pretenses. That is the feeling in the northeast of Scotland. The prices have collapsed. People's livelihoods have collapsed because the Brexiteers have sold people a pup. <clears throat> because in terms of running a successful fishing industry, you need two things. You need access to quota, certainly. You need access to markets, absolutely. And of course, the Brexiteers have given the fisher in the fishing industry of Scotland neither of these things. They neither have access to quota now nor do they have access to markets, a disaster which has befallen our fishing communities by virtue of the, the siren voices of Boris Johnson, Michael Gove and Nigel Farage. And if they ever do come back this way again, which is debatable, they better learn to swim. Also in 2014, we'll learn, don't hate the media, become the media. That was a famous slogan to encourage new media to report on the kind of events that tended to be ignored by the mainstream media. And the Alba party has de decided to include new media in its press conference, giving us the respect that all that were done in 2014 and ever since perhaps deserves. So thank you for that. But uh, with regards to the media, uh, have you received any news from Ofcom about participating in electoral debates? Well, I mean, I've got, <clears throat> I've got so little confidence in STV and BBC Scotland. Uh, you know, frankly, uh, I think these organisations would have missed the Sermon on the Mount uh, as a news story, uh, never mind interesting political developments. I don't blame the journalists, incidentally. The establishment of these organisations is totally and utterly decrepit. Uh, they're incapable of... Uh, of uh, organising their coverage in an intelligent or fair or impartial manner, to miss in terms of non-participation in debates the emerging news story of this campaign is uh, a dereliction of their duty to the Scottish people. In the case of STV, I'm highly disappointed because they've got a fine track record in many ways. In the case of BBC, well, it's par for the course. It has been ever thus. They're an organisation incapable of uh, discharging their, their duty and obligations to the people of Scotland as our apparently public service broadcaster, uh, a, a task of which they fail so fall far short. Uh, it is difficult, uh, difficult to defend any aspect of their organisation. This is not a criticism of journalists. They work in yeah. an organisation which is pretty far gone, uh, which many, of course, ex-BBC journalists uh, willingly and openly admit, and I'm afraid that it hasn't changed with the times. It's one of the relatively few organisations in Scotland that uh, that hasn't caught up with the, the new age and uh, and despite the excellence of much of the output, for example, of BBC Alapa, mm -hmm. uh, and the efforts that have been made uh, in terms of programme offers, the overall ability uh, of that organisation to stay true to what it should be doing in terms of the duty to inform the public on election debates and, uh, and election points of interest is lamentable. I mean, uh, their broadcast debate uh, last week, uh, last Tuesday, a week ago, uh, I mean, all you can say about it is there'd be far less people watching it at the end than were watching it at the beginning. And there weren't all that many people watching it at the beginning. Uh, so I know, held no great hope. But of course, uh, if they don't discharge their duties under the Ofcom, Ofcom code, then we have a recourse. And uh, uh, Alapa, as we gain support during this campaign, might well take that recourse if uh, we're forced into that position. I suspect uh, we're far better than the, the words of the British Foreign Secretary George Canning in the 19th century. We shall bring a, a new world into existence to address the balance of the old. Hence this interview, Pila, we're addressing the imbalance 
of the conventional broadcasting media in Scotland by talking to media who are interested in political thoughts, political ideas uh, and political change. Mr. Summer, I have two last questions, okay? Uh, the first one is that during Indoref, you say, although you are continually misquoted, that you, in your opinion, it was once in a lifetime opportunity, but that ultimately the Scottish people would decide. And according to the Good Friday Agreement, a generation is seven years. So why is this acceptable to Northern Ireland, but not for Scotland? And the last one is, because many would say that the Parda was broken by the vow and that the Edinburgh Agreement was broken by David Cameron just hours after the Rousseau had come in with the announcement of evil, English votes for English laws. And today you talked a lot of negotiations. So your opinion, please. Well, can I say, Pilar, that the things that you've mentioned indicate that your, your knowledge of political developments in Scotland is substantially greater than many people involved in Scottish politics as supposed journalists. Uh, and just your references there made it exactly clear uh, why, of course, the vow was broken, not just in the sense that the powers promised to Scotland weren't delivered, uh, but also in terms of the uh, changing the rules of the game at Westminster, so Scots MPs were ex excluded from voting in, on, on certain matters. So in both these respects, uh, anything agreed before that referendum was broken by David Cameron and the Conservative Party. And of course, the, the people who lined up, like Gordon Brown and others, uh, to use the vow as a means of uh, staving off the avalanche they were facing of Scottish independence support. I think it's ironic, of course, that the journalistic offer of the, the vow is now working for the SNP, as seems to have some sort of conversion to Scottish independence, which is a, I mean, I love converts. That's a very positive thing, but it seems a pretty well Damascian conversion to me. Uh, if I had offered that vow, I'd be thinking, shaming myself that... Uh, that vow had never, ever been delivered. And although I know that journalists have to work and craft things for their newspapers, I accept that, of course. But uh, deceiving a nation uh, in terms of the vital last days of a referendum campaign seems to be pretty well in the extreme sense of what is uh, regarded as acceptable in politics. So your, your point about once in a generation, once in a lifetime, in every interview where I expressed an opinion about the opportunity that Scotland had in 2014, I made it clear that it was up to the Scottish people to decide if and when they wanted to have another test, to put the matter to the touch once again, as I put it. Uh, I, there is a, a wonderful interview when I first introduced the idea of Once in a Generation with Jeremy Paxman, which is held by Angus Brendan McNeil MP. <laughs> uh, and and uh, if you ask Angus Brendan to send you it, then you'll see exactly the context in which that was put for the first time. If I have a regret, I should have made it more clear at every subsequent opportunity that, of course, the Scottish people in any election have the ability to give their marching orders to the politicians who represent their interests. I think in this election, the marching order from the Scottish people will be to advance the cause of independence with much more alacrity than it's been advanced in recent years. And that's why I think Alapa will do extraordinarily well on the regional list vote and will take the country forward. Pila, thank you very much. Yes, can, I, I don't know if the British government can be trusted to keep his word, but uh, uh, sometime ago you promised me an interview and you have kept your work. So I'm very thankful. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And I wish you, you and uh, the Alba party all the best. Kayla, thank you so much.